Hello and welcome back to Copy Break Archaeology to the Where Am I podcast where we explore the world virtually because we cannot do so physically. Now back in uh, episode 5 of the podcast we were at Sutton Hoo where we were looking at the uh, famous ship burial, the helmet and its associated cemetery. And during that episode I gave you the clues for this video to where I am today, or at least where I am virtually today. Did you manage to guess where I was? I'll give you those clues again. So I am at a site that is considered the world's oldest temple, is home to some of the world's oldest known megalithic structures, and is in the southeastern Anatolia region of Turkey. So do you know where I am? I'll give you just a few moments, you can pause the video if you like. Okay, yes, and of course I was at Gobekli Tepe uh, in Turkey. So, like with all the sites we look at, a lot can be said about uh, Gobekli Tepe. It is a very important site. Like all the sites we look at, no site is unimportant. And again, uh, it's my wish to try and keep these episodes as short as possible. The Sutton Hoo episode in particular went on far too long and I couldn't be bothered to edit it down. So we're going to go very briefly through uh, Gebekli Tepe, probably not giving it justice at all. Um, it is a very interesting site. Um, it's quite important in the understanding in the sort of origins of the Neolithic, or its links to the origins of the Neolithic and that sort of transition from hunter-gatherers to uh, to sort of the Neolithic way of sort of animal husband animal husbandry and domesticated crops, and it covers that period nicely. So Gobekli Tepe is what we uh, call a artificial or cultural mound. It is around fifty feet in height. It is almost a thousand feet in diameter, and it rises around about two thousand five hundred feet above sea level and it was made famous uh, by the German archaeologist Klaus Schmidt uh, during the 90s when he was excavating at the site. But the site was first uh, noted or first identified really uh, by a survey that was conducted by Istanbul University and the University of Chicago back in 1963. And the American archaeologist Peter Benedict identified lithics that had been collected from the surface of the site uh, belonging to the aceramic or pre-pottery Neolithic. But the um, T-shaped uh, megalithic structures, um, which sort of Gobekli Tepe is famous for, he misinterpreted as uh, potentially being a Byzantine cemetery. Um, we do know that the local uh, farmers and, and agricultural communities um, at least knew where the site was as they appear to be breaking off bits of the uh, megalithic structures and using them in things like field boundaries and for other purposes. Whether they knew in fact that these were indeed uh, man-made or natural we don't really know as the site was heavily uh, backfield and put over to agriculture uh, during its history. So uh, as mentioned Gebekli Tepe is considered uh, the world's oldest temple and holds the world's oldest uh, megalithic or some of the world's oldest megalithic structures. It dates to the, formally to the pre-pottery Neolithic uh, with a date range for the site somewhere between 10,000 to 8,000 BC or it was in use during that period so that's 12,000 to 10,000 years ago at the sort of very beginning of the Neolithic period. So what we're going to look at first is sort of a stratigraphical description of the site. Stratigraphy, stratigraphy being the layers of the site as it goes down into the earth. We're going to do it in reverse order. So we're going to look at the early stages coming up to the more recent deposits. 
So in the early stage of Gobekli Tepe, you see circular compounds or temamines, um, which range from around about 10 to 30 meters in diameter. And their noticeable feature are these T-shaped megaliths made of limestone set within the thick interior walls and with two large ones generally fitting in the middle. So four such structures have actually been unearthed to date. Uh, geophysical surveys on the site indicate that there are at least 16 more, enclosing up to eight pillars each, which gives us round about almost 200 pillars in total. Um, so these slabs were transported from uh, sort of bedrock pits or quarries that were located around about 100 metres or 330 feet away from the hilltop. So within these temines, I said there were two taller pillars facing each other in these circles. Now, whether these were used to provide roofs, it is not certain. There is no evidence for there being a roof on these structures. And stone benches, which may have been designed for sitting on, are found uh, around the interior, around sort of the interior walls. Um, and many of these pillars are decorated with uh, abstract and enigmatic pictograms and carved animal reliefs. Um, we don't know necessarily the exact interpretation of some of these. Pictograms may represent commonly understood sacred symbols, um, which similar to cave paintings and other um, symbols which are found elsewhere. So some of these reliefs depict mammals such as lions, bulls, boars, foxes, gazelles, donkeys, and also snakes and other reptiles as well. Um, there are also anthropods such as insects and arachnids and birds, particularly vultures, can also be found on these pillars. So, there are also a few humanoid figures found carved into some of the pillars at Quebec Le Tepe. And the, some of the T-shaped pillars have what have been interpreted to be human arms carved on the lower half. In fact, Klaus Schmidt did suggest that these tall pillars may represent humans as some form of ancestor worship. Uh, so that is really sort of what is in the earliest uh, layer. You also find in some of these, some of the floors are made up of what is called tarazu, which is burnt lime. Um, other floors are bedrock, um, which have pedestals to hold the large pair of central pillars. Um, and so sort of radiocarbon dating uh, places the construction of these circles in a range of somewhere between 9,600 to 8,800 BC. And at some point, these were backfilled during the, Neolith during the Neolithic period. So now moving sort of onto the next layer. Um, so in this second sort of phase of the site, um, the circular structures um, are sort of replaced with rectangular rooms. Um, rectangular buildings uh, obviously make uh, a more efficient use of space compared to circular structures, and they're often associated with the emergence of the Neolithic. But the T-shaped pillars, the sort of main feature of the older enclosures, are also present here in this layer. And as far as we can tell, appear to serve the same function um, 
potentially as sanctuaries. Um, so this sort of second phase is assigned to the uh, what is termed the pre-pottery Neolithic B or PPN B, whereas layer one was associated with PPN A. This is associated with PPN B. So it's a sort of later phase in the Neolithic. Um, so the several adjoining rectangular, doorless and windless rooms have floors of polished uh, lime, reminiscent of uh, Roman again terrazzo floors just like you had some in the first layer and again so the carbon dates for this period yield dates from around 8800 to 8000 BC again these uh, pillars in these sort of rectangular rooms are also have carved animals on it, in particular during this phase of um, lion or lion-like creatures on them. A stone, a stone pillar, sort of like a totem pole, um, were also discovered in, uh, in this layer and appears to have human-like Figures and some also appear to have a uh, predator-like figure, maybe a bear. And now we sort of move on to the last sort of layer or phase of the site, which now forms the uppermost part of the hill, but it accounts for the sort of longest time of occupation. Um, because of erosion it contains lots of loose sediments and virtually uninterrupted use of the hill for agricultural purposes since it ceased to operate as a ceremonial centre. The site was deliberately backfilled sometime after 8000 BC. Um, the buildings were buried under debris, flint, gravel stone tools and animal bones. Um, so that sort of really brings us to the end of the stratigraphical context. So now we are going to look sort of a little bit at the chronological context of the site. Now looking at the site in its broader chronological uh, uh, and um, and interpreting the site is very difficult because currently less than about 5% of the site or, or what is believed to be the extent of the site has been excavated which was very much a deliberate action by Klaus Schmidt as he wanted to leave uh, as much untouched for future uh, archaeologists with better techniques and hopefully better um, ideas and, and technology to be able to further the investigation and while as I said the site formerly belongs to uh, the earliest Neolithic the PPNA to date there has been no traces of domesticated plants or animals to be found at the site um, so it has been assumed that you know so assumed that's um, been sort of hunter-gatherers who sort of lived in seasonal villages who uh, built at least in its earliest phases uh, Gobekli Tepe um, but again that, that it sort of does border very much that period between hunter-gatherers and farming um, so it, the, the structures in its early in their early phases do predate pottery and, and uh, metallurgy and also potentially the Neolithic revolution which 
although again dates are always fle very flexible, is still put at around about 9000 BC. So the construction of Gobekli Tepe really implies an organisation of a very sophisticated and advanced group of people who have time to sort of put into this large megalithic construction. It has been estimated that potentially up to 500 persons were required to extract these heavy pillars from the local quarries and the bedrock pits and move them, you know, 100 to 500 meters or 330 feet to almost 2,000 feet up to the site with pillars weighing 10 to 20 metric tons. And with one of ones actually still left, which is still left in the creek, weighing up to 50 tons. But the site again develops, and by the time of the 8th millennium BC, the site appears to lose its importance, potentially because of the advent of agriculture and animal husbandry, um, brought around different ideas or different realities to human life. Um, we, we don't know why it lost its significance, but potentially it was a change in ideas that were brought about with the onset of the Neolithic Revolution. So Again, trying to interpret a site such as this is always very difficult because, again, it is in existence for around about 2,000 years. The people who start building the site aren't the same, or not necessarily the same people in terms of culture that then have buried the site or, or leave the site. And again, you have many, many generations in between. So looking at interpretations can sometimes be very difficult because although there may have been a agreed set of beliefs behind what the site was and what the site was used for, those kind of things we can only speculate based off the evidence that is left behind and with only 5% of the site or less than 5% of the site being excavated there's still that 95% that could hold a whole load of different set of ideas entirely. So, what did Schmidt believe Gobekli Tepe was? Well, he sort of viewed it as this sort of Stone Age mountain sanctuary or cathedral on the hill and that it was a pilgrimage de destination attracting worshippers from around about 150 kilometres or 90 miles around. Butchered bone bones found in large uh, numbers from the uh, local game, such as deer, gazelle, pigs and geese, have been identified as refuse from food hunted and cooked or otherwise prepared for congregants. Schmidt considered Gobekli Tepe as a central location for the cult of the dead, and carved animals are there to protect the dead. Though no tombs or graves have yet been found, Schmidt believed that graves remain yet to be discovered in the niches located behind the walls and sacred circles. Although, potentially again, back, uh, something else that may... Uh, add to this interpretation was back in 2017 there was a discovery of a human crania with incisions and this has been interpreted as providing evidence for a new form of neolithic skull cult uh, such such as you know the the other um stone cults that have been suspected to exist such as at the site of uh, telesultan or Jericho in Palestine. Now Schmidt also believed that the site uh, had a very strong connection with the early stages of the Neolithic. It is one of 
several sites that are in the vicinity of Karakadag, uh, which is the area that geneticists um, suspect may have been the original source of some of our early cultivated grains, such as einkorn. Uh, Schmidt also engaged in speculation regarding the belief systems uh, of the groups that created Gebekli Tepe. Um, based on comparisons with other shrines and settlements, he was strongly in favour of uh, shamanistic or shamanic practices and suggested that the T-shapes, as we said earlier, represented these human forms, maybe as some form of ancestor worship. And he did not believe that a sort of a... a did not believe that a fully articulated belief in deities um, did not appear until later in Mesopotamia. Uh, but one could, you know, go on for quite a long time um, thinking about and, and uh, about what these strange pillars and strange carvings may mean. And we have only excavated the royal we. Um, at least, you know, 5% of this site. So the other 95% could still completely change uh, what Schmidt and other researchers have, have looked into the site and, and the current interpretation, the current narrative of the site. So without further ado, we're going to leave our exploration into Gobekli Tepe there uh, for today. So that brings us to the site where I am today and the clues for you to guess. So, today's site could be described as Britain's Pompeii. It is known to have the best preserved Bronze Age dwellings ever found which were abandoned due to a catastrophic incident. And there we go, I think. Again, I'm very fond of just three clues. It can be described as Britain's Pompeii, has some of the best preserved Bronze Age dwellings ever found, which were abandoned during a catastrophic event. So, can you guess who I am? Good luck with your guesses. I'd like to thank you again for tuning in to episode six of this podcast. If you're enjoying this so far, please do like and share the video. Hit subscribe and the notification bell if you want to find get notifications when the next episode is uploaded. Until next time, take care.